I fell into documentaries almost by accident. I was doing lots of other different types of work and then I met a guy called Stephen Walker who was directing a film about uh, some other filmmakers going to Cannes. It was a very funny film and it was the first time that I'd seen a documentary that wasn't just giving me facts about something or feel, felt like a duty, or like a textbook, which a lot of documentaries were. This was funny and inventive and we, we were speeding things up. I went and worked on that and to keep it short, that opened my eyes to the creative possibilities of documentary. That in a lot of ways it's like narrative cinema in that, or narrative filmmaking, in that you're telling a story, but it's real, which makes it even better. There's no rules, and there are very formal rules to narrative and genre filmmaking, and you can break them, but they're there. In documentary, there really are no rules. You make your own grammar up each time you begin. The whole process of editing documentaries is very organic, and it's quite exciting. It's, it's like a bit like music making, like improv jazz improvisation or music improvisation, where you come in each day and you're, where should we go next? Let's do that. What happens if we cut that against that? <gasps> wow, let's go there, and you follow your instincts and follow your creative urges. I mean, in Amy, for instance, a lot of the performances are amalgams of several performances. So each of those sequences had to really hit and be beautiful and moving and powerful. And in the case of Amy, we were using them almost as, as part of the storytelling. Um, Asif Kapadia, who directed it, had a very clear, clear idea early that he wanted to try and do the film like Bollywood, where in Bollywood the, the songs are the story, they are the film, they're not just moments where you stop and listen to some nice music and then the, the drama takes place again, they are the drama. Um, and Amy's songs were so autobiographical, we thought, well, OK, we're going to make them tell the story of her life and then surround it with the, the other material. So those scenes had to really hit, but you often found that the performance coverage was quite limited and then you found somebody in the crowd on the subsequent night filming the same song on a, per, a per, you know, personal camcorder or on an iPhone and I'd integrate all that into a single performance so you get cutaways, close-ups, hand holding the microphone, all the shots that you'd need to make a beautiful sequence, integrate all that seamlessly. I would take, I don't take any issue with that whatsoever, I think that's completely justified. It's artifice, but filmmaking is artifice, all of filmmaking is artifice. So to do that kind of thing, if I had said this took place then and it took place somewhere completely different, that's an outright lie and you would quite rightly be called up for it. Within the process of making a film and what you show, you, you can be as creative as you like, as long as you're being, there's a, a central honesty to it, particularly in documentaries. The funniest and strangest filmmaking experience I'd had, I met a director on a rooftop at 10 o'clock at night with an air vent billowing out steam in the East End, literally standing there with a light shining and then a figure came out. It was like something out of um, All the President's Men. Um, uh, so that's how I met Banksy and was kind of cross-examined. He was very keen, I think, to go with people that he thought he could trust. And that was why I was working with uh, Jamie DeCruz, the producer, who um, er, many years earlier had done something with Banksy before he was famous and had not then revealed his identity when everyone was clamouring to know who is Banksy. So we went in and the original idea was that it was going to be a street art film, a film about street art, this m art movement. And the material had been shot by this French guy called Thierry Guetta. So I started dutifully going through that and the, it was, the footage was unusable, most of it. It was ridiculous. So most of the time, if a m person was up a ladder doing a piece of art on the wall, Terry would be filming the ladder and not the art being made. And then right at the very end, it might pan over and you'd hear him talking all the way through it. And the way he spoke and the, his, he would fall over, he became the character that we were more interested in. And I thought, OK, I wouldn't necessarily go and see a film about street art. It's not something I'm interested in. It would be like somebody saying, do you want to come and see a film about cheese? Well, I don't mind cheese, but I'm not sure I want to see a film about cheese. But when it became the story of a French guy who documented an underground art movement for a decade before putting his camera down and becoming a street artist himself and plagiarising the person that he'd been shadowing for a decade and then becoming a millionaire and one of the most successful street artists of all time, that was a film that I found interesting and I realised that you'd learn enough about street art through that story as much as you, an impartial person would like to know. We started that film without 
knowing that Terry was about to put on that huge show in Los Angeles that forms the finale, uh, that happened six months into the edit. And we, even then, we didn't know how big it was. We heard that he was going to put on a show. We thought it was going to be, uh, you know, a small room with some pictures on the walls and a glass of wine and a few friends hanging around. So when it turned into this huge multimedia event with thousands of people queuing and it became the art uh, event of, of that year in LA, people rushed out with cameras to cover the kind of chaos that ensued. So it was a very organic film to make. I mean, we literally didn't know what the film was going to be like until it was finished. It's very easy to copy other people's work. It's very easy, particularly in British television, they like to do things in a kind of cookie cutter fashion. They'll hit on something that's successful and then that will be on a lot. It's very it's much rarer on British television now to see one-off documentaries or have their own grammar. Those stand out because somebody has considered, how do I want to tell this story? What's my voice? What's my approach? Uh, not being told, this is how we want it done. So I say to anyone who's trying to break in, really think about what you want to say, what authorial voice you want to have. Even as an editor, it sounds like that's a directorial decision. Actually, you as an editor have a lot of input into the final uh, construction of the film and what the film actually is, the tangible construction at the end of it. Never forget the power of a simple cut, that joining this with this makes something completely different. And if you experiment with that in your own leisure time, away from the constraints of a professional environment, you'll find your voice. That's a way to do it. You know that if you add music to four different types of music, that's always a good experiment. Take a piece of footage and put four different types of music on and play it each time and feel how what you've, you're looking at changes. That and a simple cut will get you on your way to becoming an editor, particularly in documentaries.